you can get more money. Mm-hmm. You can you can rebuild your self esteem. You can do all those things. Violence comes in your life, man. You can't undo it. So yeah. if you can train your brain to understand violence and to how to respond to that and how to really protect yourself. What I want people to do is I want to protect themselves. When they see an act of violence, I don't want them to do things that are going to make them an easier victim. Welcome back, everyone, to the School of Greatness podcast. We have the legendary Tim Larkin in the house. Good to see you, man. man. Very excited. Been a while. Last time we hung out was at your gun range in in Vegas, and I got to shoot some really cool guns. Yes. My girlfriend, Jen. And um, it's good to see you here, man. And I'm excited about... Love the place, man. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm excited about this topic because I think it's timely with a lot of uncertainty, especially in the U.S., but around the world with all these different bombings and attacks and just... People feeling unsettled in general. Uh, you are one of the leading experts on violence and self-defense in the world, and you've got this book out called When Violence is the Answer, Learning How to Do What It Takes When Your Life is at Stake. Make sure you guys pick this up right now, Amazon and everywhere books are sold. Um, now, why we were just talking about this before we started. Uh, most people, you were saying, don't feel like they – need to protect themselves or they need to like take training on self-defense. Is that what I heard? Most people, until they get an attack or something happens, they feel like they don't need it. Yeah. It's, it, happens? It, it's a misunderstanding. So, so most people think, uh, in, in, in not even the idea of violence, they, they think the idea of training for say self-defense or something yes. like that, that it's, it's really reserved for the physically elite. You oh. know, they see something like the UFC and they see some of those amazing athletes yeah. and they say, well, geez, I can never be that. So therefore, there's no reason for me to train or they go the opposite route and they say, well, I'm just going to buy a gun. You know, that's the extreme or pepper spray. Or pepper or, yeah, spray. Yeah. They're going to default to a tool, you know? And the idea is, you know, what makes us, you know, so amazing, what makes us so dangerous at the same time is the human brain. And so it's the idea of engaging your brain first and training your brain. Um, and, and understanding the principles of violence. And, and you have to specifically say violence because when we say fighting, mm-hmm. fighting can be a lot of different things. You know, you, know uh, you can fight with your friend, you can fight with your mom, you can fight yeah. with, you know, it's a very vague term. Mm-hmm. When you say violence, everybody knows what you're talking about, you know, and, and that's the idea. That's really what we're, we're worried about. We're worried about another human being, a bigger, faster, stronger human being dominating us. You know, that's probably our most innate fear. And yet we have got to the point in our society where this subject has become so taboo that the only people that have access to it really are the predators or say the first responders Mm -hmm. in a very different manner. The civilian population, the ones that are most affected by violence, um, have basically been told, Hey, don't, don't worry about it. Don't, you know, you don't want to train. You don't want to do these things, you know, just obey the laws, you know, right. uh, You'll be okay. Comply. You know, we'll get here. Well, that's just not the case. We're seeing that more and more. And you see extreme examples like, uh, you know, some of the attacks that we've seen lately where people are using vehicles or using knives or using very low tech, you know, violence with intent and people really don't have an answer to it. And so the idea is my, my big goal is to say it's okay to study the, the subject of violence. It's all right for us to look at. It doesn't make us violent. It doesn't make us criminal, you know, but it is a life skill everybody should be aware of. Yeah, yeah. This, I'm going to ask my the ladies in here, have you guys ever done any self-defense classes? One time at girls' camp when one, I was like 15. One time at girls' camp when you were 15. Have you? No to self-defense. No self-defense. Now, do you think this should be a requirement for – Everyone, you know, not just women in general, because I think those are the the individuals that probably experience more attacks or susceptible to more attacks in general, at least in our society. But do you feel like it should be a requirement for all women and for all human beings, whether it be in grade school or middle school or high school, at some point to go through a basic training self-defense class or when violence comes class? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and and here's, and people get skewered for this. You know, we had the uh, former Miss America when she accepted, Mm -hmm. uh, she's a Miss Nevada. And uh, when she uh, got up there, she said, hey, I I have a black belt in Taekwondo and I think every girl should, you know, learn how to defend herself. You know, just a very vanilla statement. Yeah. She got skewered. She was told that, no, you know, you're telling women 
that they should learn how to how to protect themselves rather than tell men that they shouldn't be attacking women. I understand that. You're both. I, I, I absolutely <laughs> yeah. understand. That. It's just like you know, I don't think anybody should. You know, like this is your studio. I don't think anybody should come in here and rob your studio and take all of your stuff. Yeah, yeah. But that doesn't mean that you don't lock your doors. Exactly. You know. Yeah. And, and so there, there's some reality you have to put into this. Mm-hmm. And um, with women, I think the subject is is just explained wrong to them for the most part. They they try. They're they're taught as a lesser. Um, a, a lesser citizen in it. You know, the men, they know how to take care of themselves. Hey honey, we're going to teach you this way. Male or female, when we train, you know, women, I find women to be better students. Mm. They don't try to muscle things. They have a very clear understanding. They use the technique better probably. Very much so. And the interesting thing about women versus men is, you know, you and I have had to navigate um, inner male aggression. We've had to navigate locker room, yeah. you know, stuff where we communicate, guys communicate sometimes with violence. So we yeah. have that social violence that we have to say, is this social violence or is this the real thing? Women don't have that. When they experience violence, it's the real thing. Therefore, their ability to react once properly trained is, you know, pretty instantaneous. Because they're not roughhousing a lot no. and experiencing just... No, they know if a man puts their hands on it, and it is men. Men, is, men are the threat to, to women. Men are the, the over, overwhelming majority of incidents involving, you know, physical really? violence. And, and that is the biggest threat to women is, is a male, you know, a, a male, you know, uh, using violence against a woman. And do, we, do we notice statistics yearly, at least in the U.S., of like how yeah, many we, domestic violence or whatever violence there is? We had, you know, I had the latest statistics in my last book. I uh-huh. just don't, I don't want to give those because it's a couple of years ago, but right. I, I did this book a, a while back. You know, the telling thing for me was I was with, you know, mutual friend of Tony Robbins. Yeah. We, were, we were at an event and Tony, you know, Tony being Tony, he goes, it's, it's a couple's event. And he basically asked the crowd, he said, listen, I'm not saying you, that anything was about to happen or you really felt that he goes, but I'm saying the last, what do you say? In the last week have, it has an incident occurred where you felt there was a potentiality for violence. There was a potentiality for you to experience a violent situation in your relationship or in life. Just, he just put it out like yeah. that. Probably less than 5% of the men raised their hands. Mm-hmm. Okay. Last week. 95% of the women had their hands Really? Up. Just maybe walking down the street or just feeling yeah, weird? Yeah, you know, is... getting in an elevator, unfamiliar male comes uh-huh. in there. They're, they're far more, aw- women are far more aware of violence than men for the most part, the potentiality for violence. Yeah. And what's interesting is it's they also are the most difficult to get in to take training. Why is that? We've been told, they've been told to society, it's not, you know, first of all, it's not, you know, ladylike. You know, you have that aspect of it. We're getting kind of past that. And then a lot of the training is not really <clears throat> geared towards women. Um, if, I, if I have a woman, we have to assume the threat's always going to be bigger, faster, stronger, male or female, you know, if we're, mm-hmm. facing, we're facing something. Women, though, are constantly put in situations where they're supposed to try to compete on athleticism and strength in, in, certain, situ- in certain situations, in combat sports. Yes. What we need to do with women is train them to understand how to injure the human body. Injury to the human body, which is a, a differentiation, uh, it, it's, it's putting an injury on the human body that takes away the bigger, faster, stronger aspects of things. Um, there are areas in the human body that are all accessible. We're all weak in the areas of our body. You know, So the big thing, the big mind training, that I, uh, the mind switch that I get with women is I train them to stop looking at the differences in their attacker and start looking at the similarities. Mm. And the idea is, instead of saying, oh my God, this guy's so much bigger than me, he goes, oh, he has a neck like me. Oh, oh, he has a knee like me. Oh, he has. She starts recognizing right away all the, all the points that are going to, you know, she can go directly to and get a result if her Eyes, life is on the line. Yeah, neck, all of that. Knees. And so and, and it's that, that's the biggest difference in when you're talking about, you know, using violence to protect yourself is you have to be able to recognize the uh, similarities in the human body and go after those and ignore all the differences, you know? Sure. Um, and it, it takes a little bit of time to, to get that across. Not, no, n- not a long time, but mm-hmm. you just wrap your head around it. Once you make that switch, it's amazing. You look, people laugh all the time. In fact, I was just doing a, an interview with a friend of mine a while back and he goes, you know, I had to stop training last year. He goes, cause I kept, you know, all he saw were targets on the human body when I was talking to really? people. He had been, and he's trained for years w- sure. with us and everything. And he was, he was half joking, but he, but he wasn't. That's what I want to give everybody is the potentiality that, Hey, I know exactly where to go and what to do. Mm-hmm. You know, should there be a physical altercation, but I don't have to live this crazy paranoid life. Sure. You know, I yeah. can actually, what's, what's really interesting is the more you study the subject of violence, the more peaceful your life is. It, it's, it's crazy. You know, it's counterintuitive. 
But the idea is it's almost like anything else that you conquer. You know, if you, if you have a fear of swimming and you learn to swim, you no longer are nervous around water anymore mm-hmm. or anything like this. Once you understand the, the, the tool of violence and how it applies to you and how you can use it and you know what you need to respond to and what you don't need to respond to, all of a sudden you look at the world differently and you look at mm-hmm. threats differently. Yeah. And that's the greatest thing. Yeah, to give people that kind of confidence to understand yeah. that, you know, is really huge. Yeah, I think it's more, it's really just setting yourself up to win in every situation. So when you're walking down the street and there's someone walking behind you, you know, just understanding what you should be thinking about or how you should be approaching it. Or if you're in an elevator and then someone comes in who maybe has a weird vibe, like where to stand and how to position yourself and just how to be prepared if something goes wrong, yeah. right? Yeah. And uh, I'm assuming that's a lot of what it is, just like being aware being mindful and yep. being ready for anything. Yep. Not saying you have to have your guard up all the time, but just like, okay, well, I'm going to turn this way and wait 30 seconds until I'm out of the elevator. And then I know I'm good to go. I don't have to worry right now. Yeah. Is that a yeah. lot of it? Or yeah. Just- that, that's well, well, the, the whole idea is for you to, to sit there and just have an understanding of how the tool, how, how the tool works. You know, I, I give extreme examples. Um, but basically if, uh, you know, if, if there was an assault right now, somebody ran in here, Right. And, uh, you know, attacked me, say, say attacked me and was successful and grabbed a knife and, and, you know, stabbed me and killed me, you know, to, to neck. horrible, right? <laughs> yeah. It would, it would be, a crim- it'd be a criminal act yeah. and, and, uh, you know, he probably should be prosecuted, mm-hmm. uh, to full extent of law, probably incarcerated the rest of his life. Um, or we could have that same scenario. A guy comes in and this time I'm successful. I see that he's, you know, he's getting in a lethal and my life is in danger and I see that knife and I'm able to use that knife. I'll stab him in the same area of the neck and I end wow. up killing him, you know, wow. horrific, but probably should agree that, Hey, Tim was justified in doing that. This guy was, you know, th- this guy was absolutely um, criminal and trying to kill him and he was mm-hmm. in fear for his life. Yeah. What I try to get everybody to understand is we love the story on either side of that. Yeah. But the <laughs> fact is this, if it was the good guy or the bad guy, the knife to the side of the neck worked each time. It didn't care if it was a good guy or a bad guy. Mm-hmm. So therefore, violence is just a tool. And learning how to use it effectively does not make you a criminal. Um, how you use the tool will be determined whether or not it was justified or or you know right. criminal. Sure. And everybody says, well, aren't you afraid putting information out like this, you know, that the predators will have it all? You know, that's the first thought. <laughs> I understand where they're coming from, but the sad truth is, and the scary fact is, that smart. they don't need it. Yeah, yeah, they don't they need it. They already just got it. Yeah, yeah. The people that really need it are, you know, the the, the good people that are out there. You know, your folks that are listening right now, I would mm-hmm. say the majority of them need this information. You know? Yeah, I would say probably 90% of people haven't gone through a self-defense. No. I'm just assuming, but maybe I'm wrong. A lot, of the, a, a lot of the fault training. of that is our industry. Our industry yeah. puts it out like, you know, uh, there's a lot of machoism in, in the industry. There's a lot of guru, follow the guru. You know, it's not really client focused. You know, we try to be very client focused. Everybody's human machine is different. You know, you're taller, you know, she's smaller. She's, you, we work with everybody's human machine because it's a very personal thing and everybody's human machine can get a result. Um, but if you sit there and the whole thing is about, Hey, look like me, or I'm going to put you in these really difficult scenarios mm-hmm. that basically are going to break your confidence. It's going to yeah. make the instructor look good, but it's going to make you all you're going to come away. If, if, if any of your training is such that the only thing you can come away and say, Oh my God, my instructor was so amazing. He was great. You know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, that's bad instruction. Sure. Sure. You know, it really is about, Hey, what can he get you to do? Mm-hmm. You know? And that's my goal. My goal is whenever I, I come in contact with anybody, you know, by their end of their time with me, you know, what were they able, what did they come here with and what did I have them leave with? Mm-hmm. And that's the most important thing. And that's a very hard thing because there's lots of things I would love to show people. Yeah. Um, and it's fun. A lot of the fun stuff that I like to do is beyond most people's coordination. You know, sure. it would take me too long to get there, but I can make them effective very quickly. You don't mm-hmm. have to be, um, you know, an amazing athlete to be effective with the tool of violence. Yeah. Let's just say people listening are never going to take a self-defense class. Yep. But they're listening here and you've got a few minutes to share with them some basic training verbally or if they're watching on the video. Uh, what would you say are the main things they should be focused on when they feel an attack, hand to hand, no weapon, but just a, a physical attack in it? You know, this is hard to, I guess, put parameters, but just in a no. normal setting. You know, no, no, <laughs> normal you, violence setting. <laughs> the the one thing that I would that I would absolutely tell everybody to do, and it's going to sound like a pat answer, and it's uh-huh. not. Pay attention to the nonverbal cues. Mm. Pay attention to your situations, and, and I'll tell you, I talk to everybody that's had 
you know, as I told you, 70% of people come to me, come to me after the fact, after, after violence has already affected their lives. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, cause they don't want it to happen again. They want to be yeah, ready for it. Yeah. They want you know, It's kind of like, it's like everybody buys a burglar alarm after you've had the break in right. you know, type thing. I can't undo what's already been done, but I can give them principles and methods to make sure that it minimizes the chance of it happening yet. One of the things that I've learned is when I, t- when I walk people back, people normally will come to a point to where I felt uncomfortable here. Mm hmm. But socially, it would have been awkward for me to do X, Y, or Z. So I continued on. And then by the time it got to here, you know, so they, it was already, we're talking about, like you're saying, hey, hands on physical. If it gets hands on physical and you have nothing in the toolbox, you know, I can tell you, hey, do whatever it takes, but you don't know whatever it takes. You know, you yeah. haven't thought about that. So, yes, if you're going to, if, if somebody is putting their hands on you and you're facing grievous bodily harm, I mean, you need to be able to physically protect yourself. Um, most people, though, can avoid 99% of those incidents by following all these nonverbal cues that we get. You know, our body communicates to us in much different ways. fear, sensory. Yeah, all these things. And and be okay with being embarrassed. Be okay with looking, you know, ridiculous. Better to look ridiculous and be alive. Absolutely. You know, um, I had a a friend's wife who, uh, she was a, a teacher, she was a PhD, and she was finishing up, her age, before she got her PhD, she was finishing up at grad school one night. She was parked on the third floor. Her friends were parked on the second floor. Her friends said, hey, we'll drive you up, you know, drop your car. It wasn't too bad. It was like, you know, probably 930 at night. Um, it was in San Diego. And she was like, oh, no, there's no reason. Even though there's a sketchy guy that was walking around mm-hmm. in there. And, and she felt bad because she thought maybe she was judging this guy. So she lets her friends go to the car. She comes up. Now, luckily, she's one of my instructor's wives and she had been through not a lot of training. She'd only been through like one of our weekend programs and it's like two years prior. When she got to the third floor, the door opens and there he is. No she's way. literally right there. That's and freaky. she just knew right away. She had her briefcase in her hand and she just rammed her briefcase into his groin. And then she was able to, to hit him in the side of the neck. Now she's a little woman. She was like five one and this guy was much bigger, but you know, he reacted to the strike to the groin and then the neck was exposed and she was able to hit the neck and hit it onto the side of the, uh, of the, uh, door, the, the, you know, the elevator door that knocked him out at wow. that point, you know, it was because he was not expecting this, Sure. you know, and she felt threatened right away. And this is what I'm talking about women. You know, she didn't hesitate. She knew there was something wrong. wait a minute. He was just on the first floor. He saw me say goodbye to my friends. I come up and he's not just like there. He's right there, you know, getting in there. So she didn't hesitate, which to her credit, you know, probably saved her from a physical assault. Now, the question a lot of people say, well, gee, what, you know, you know, like. Maybe he wasn't going to do anything. What was he going to do? You know, maybe it was a huge misunderstanding. And her husband says the same thing every time he goes, well, I'm really happy it turned out that way. Mm -hmm. He said, because I I still have my wife. My sons still have their mom. Mm -hmm. And it could have been that way. But what they do know is by the time security got up there, that guy was gone. Mm. You know, he was, he was out of there. So, you know, most likely he wasn't, uh, he wow. wasn't planning anything you know good, but those are the type of stories that, uh, that I tell because, you know, everybody goes, wow, that's amazing. And you know, like, look, oh, she knew how to, and you're thinking, oh, okay. Uh, you know, uh, uh, briefcase to the groin and then side of the neck, <laughs> you're thinking wrong because what she kicks herself about is she said, I knew, I knew and I ignored it because it was, it was socially awkward. I didn't want to put my friends out. I didn't want to do that. And she almost had a horrible thing happen to her, mm-hmm. you know, and she was able to avoid it. And it was just because she did have something in the toolbox. She was able to protect herself. But she shouldn't even have to go there. That's just what take we the ride when she That's had the feeling. The, yeah. Say, yeah, drive me up. It's two minutes extra. Or That's the goal. That's the goal yeah. with every one of my clients. Or someone walk with me up yeah. there or whatever. Yeah. I had a client. Um, I, I was talking. I just was thinking about this guy the other day. Uh, he was a, he was an oil, a Texas oil guy. It's probably about uh, 15 years ago. Big dude. And just, you could tell, former a- uh, Texas A&M football player. Yeah. He just liked to go to honky tonks and get in fights. He's yeah. just one of those guys, a brawler, you know, like, like not, a, not a jerk, but he was looking for fights. You know, yeah. he just thought it was fun. And he came to me on the second day of training and he said to me, he goes, hey, uh, I just want to thank you. And I'm like, you know, what are you talking about? He said, uh, he goes, I called my wife this morning and I told her, I said, uh, just after the first day of training, he said, I am so lucky all these years that I didn't inadvertently injure somebody, um, you know, irreparably and, and, you know, get myself in real bad trouble and be in jail. He goes, and conversely, I didn't run into somebody that was a true predator that could have easily killed me mm. on that. And he goes, I just want to, I, he goes, I just want you to know you don't have to worry about me anymore. And his wife was crying on the phone, you know, it was there, but it was a wow. complete behavioral change because 
when you show people, like people come to me all the time, they'll say, oh, you know, show me, uh, you know, they'll, they'll say it half jokingly. They'll say, oh, well, how do you kill a guy? I go, like this. Boom, and I show them three or four things, you know, real quick. Boom, boom, they go, whoa, no, that's not what I mean. What scares them is it's yeah. so easy. Yeah. The, the, the human body is very fragile. I mean, we have tons of articles of two guys getting an argument, one guy pushing another guy, the other guy braining himself. He's dead. Okay, so the back human, of his neck. Or yeah. His head. So, so that idea of you know when you're talking about just pure violence, it's extremely easy, easy to injure somebody. Um, so they'll say something like that, and then they'll want to back off, and they'll say, "No, no, I just want to hurt him just enough." <laughs> you know, I just want to, do that. to get away. And the problem yeah. is, there's no guarantees when you cross that physical plane. You know, with adrenaline and yeah, power. Yeah, you don't know how it's going to act. I mean, I show videos all the time in training where I'll show the epic bar brawl where there's two guys just slugging it out, and it's and it's horrific. You know, I mean, they're really going at each other. But at the very end, they both walk away, and you know, it's one of those type of deals. Then I'll show this another scenario looks very similar at the start. One guy hits another guy. That guy hits the floor, cracks his head, and he's dead. This mm -hmm. guy's facing manslaughter now. Wow! And it's over like that. The same exact type of scenario. It was just luck of the draw that one didn't happen. And so you ask yourself all the time, you go, was that necessary? You know, I talk about the idea of looking at an event three days from now. Is it going to really affect you? You know, w before you want to take that action, like on a road rage incident, you know, guy cut you off, especially, you know, here we're back in LA again. <laughs> you know, for me, I, I bring back some amazing road rage stories, you know, from living here. Um, but that urge before you do that, you go, are you willing are you willing to, to take the consequences of this? Yeah. Because what you think is going to be maybe just a verbal or or a gesture exchange could easily have you run off the road yeah. and somebody coming at you for physical violence. It's happened. I've had many of those people show up in my training. Um, wow. and, and are you prepared for that? And does it pass the three-day, you know, the three-day test I talk about all the time is three days from now, if you're sitting in a jail cell, you know, about this event saying, okay, was it worth it? You know, at that point, do you know, did you really feel your, your life was in jeopardy and that you had no options and that you were devoid of choice and you had to take action? Very few things meet that threshold. Or the other aspect I ask is, you know, three days from now, you're six feet under in a grave and your family's lost you and everything. Yeah. Again, does, do either of those things meet that threshold? And when you look at uh, situations like that, you calm down a lot. You realize, hey, you know, this guy's having a bad day. I'm just going to let him go. Mm -hmm. I'm going to let him take a deep that. breath. And yeah. I, I, I joke with people I, all the time, kind of half hearted, and it sounds kind of extreme, but I tell people all the time, you know, I conduct my life um, in a manner that when I treat, when I meet people I don't know, I basically assume they're six seconds away from a shooting spree. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't want to be the one to trigger it. Yeah, yeah. And so what does that mean? It just means all the things that you, you talk about all the time, you know, how to, how to live a great life yeah. and how to be, be that person to that unknown person person mm -hmm. even if they're a little bit aggressive with you or something yeah you know quickly if you can say hey you know like people talk about this all the time something as simple as a guy getting aggressive with you or something you just you just interrupt them and yeah. you just go hey i'm tim yeah hey man nice to meet you hey, I, you know sorry about what as soon as you say hey i'm tim or i'm lewis all of a sudden you're a person now yeah you know and it, it kind of you know it does pattern interrupt but people don't do those things people let their mm -hmm. egos get away and, and, and women are not immune from this. Women, especially uh, on the road race incidents, you know, they get really, you know, they get something about getting behind that wheel that they just get very, very free with their gestures. Sure. And I've had, unfortunately, I've had a lot of them, you know, have incidents where they've, and that's what motivated them to come for training Yeah. on that. So, you know, the physical is an absolute must for people when I have them. I want them to experience the physical because I want them to know what it takes if they, if they ignore everything. Mm -hmm. So if they, if you're going to ignore that, that uncomfortable feeling uh -huh. and you're going to, you're going to let the social awkwardness, you know, keep you from getting yourself out of that situation. Okay. Now I'm going to show you what it's going to take to get out of this because once it crosses the physical threshold and this person is coming at you for grievous bodily harm, you're going to have to do some very straightforward things to take care of yourself yeah. and, and do that. And what's interesting is when I kinesthetically link it in with training, then they hear the, the, the preventative, the mm -hmm. stuff that we've always heard. Mm -hmm. Hey, don't do the, you know, don't go to the ATM at night. Don't, yeah. you know, all those things that you've heard a million times, but you still do whatever you want to do. Once you've had the physical aspect of the training, you understand what it takes. You go, you know what? I can get up 15 minutes early tomorrow. Yeah. The ATM. I don't need to, I, I, can, I don't want it to get to this point. Yeah. I, I can do these behavior modifications, yeah. you know? Um, and, and that's, you know, that's, that was a motivation for me for, for really writing the book. The, 
training your mind correctly is the most important thing. I can train everybody physically, but if mm-hmm. I have not got your mind wrapped around the subject correctly, and most very few people do, yeah. and I'm talking like, I, I'm in Vegas. I have a lot of top MMA guys that are there, and a lot of them are my friends, and they've come to me for training, and they don't really have a good understanding of how to deal with violence. They're ex- Outside of the ring. Yeah, they're ex- and, and, and they admit it. You know, A lot of the guys admit it. A lot of guys take additional training and they do some stuff and I've got some really good friends and they're fun guys to train. They're great. Really humble, you know, mm-hmm. for the most part, most of the guys that I met. But what's interesting is they understand that the gamification of violence, it can only be gamified if we take injury out of it. So the way they train, they train to better their opponent. And in order to do that, if you just want to look at what is the difference between violence and a combat sport, look at the rules. And the rules basically take out all injury to the human body. And injury to the human body is what makes us all the same. And injury to the human body is the one thing that we can all do to each other. Mm. Um, Now, we all can't compete. I can't get in the ring and compete with any of those top MMA guys and under their rules. And they're they're amazing athletes, you know. Um, They're good. We all have a chance in violence, you know. And and I see it time and time again. And there's plenty of video I have of top MMA competitors, unfortunately, out in the real world, maybe being too aggressive or doing something and then being taken out by just normal guys. Really? Normal guys. That do, I have this one in, down, down in Brazil, these two fighters, and I show it. I show how great they are in the ring. They're amazing in the ring. And then I show them at a gas station where they're kind of rude to two girls and some no, just normal, regular guys come in and they can't handle the idea of a whole bunch of guys in an open area. They they go right into the combat sport mode, which is great, and they're doing really good one on one, and they're not paying attention to anything else. And that's when they clock in the back. One right? guy gets in and ends up in a coma. The other guy was severely beaten. Wow. On it, you know, and and it's it's not because there there's something wrong with them. It's just it's how they they train. They mm-hmm. responded with a with a competition. Yeah. To guys that were using destruction. Yep. And, and that's you know that's just not a good mix. Yeah. When you go that. What would you say to all the uh, peacemakers out there that say violence is never the answer? Um, they are living in a the reason, especially if they're living in the United States. The reason they're able to live the life they're able to live and the freedom they're able to live and everything there is because we've been extremely good at violence. I mean, the reason they we as a human race exist is because we are by far the best species in the world at doing violence. Um, and I don't mean that from a glorification standpoint. I just mean that if, if not, because we are not the biggest, fastest, and strongest. What makes us dangerous is our brains. You know, we're, we're good. We, we know how to work together. We know how to do things. Um, violence is part of us, okay? Now, what, they, what, what they're talking about, I would say to them, there is never a reason to use um, criminal violence. I absolutely agree with that. There is no reason for, for that. But when you are facing grievous bodily harm, yeah. devoid of choice. You protect yourself. You, you don't have that. And, and, you know, I've done these talks. I've done these talks with, with, uh, with pacifist groups. And they've agreed with me, you know, on, on there. I've had uh, tons of missionaries go through my training, mm. you know, that they go through. And they understand the idea of justified violence. Yeah. You know, um, it, but it, it, you don't advocate violence. But they're yeah. absolutely right. I mean, I think what most people... I think what people do is that they, they misunderstand what, what you're talking about. Sure, sure. It would be like saying like war. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Violence is, you know, and violence just has that, that, you know, the name's so strong, you know, that word is so strong. Um, you have to think of it objectively, you know, it, it, you have to think of it as a tool. So you have to think of it the same way you would think of as a car, you know, okay. A car can, you know, go be great for transportation and everything. It can also, you know, mow a bunch of people down on a city street in France and, you know, you can do some horrible things with a car. Yeah. But the car itself isn't the problem. It's how the car is used. And so violence uh, definitely has a place in our society. Um, and it has a place in us as, as, as civilians, as, as law-abiding citizens. The tool of violence is absolutely something we all should have. You know, just like we all should have a fire extinguisher. Mm-hmm. I mean, <clears throat> the fact that people have, say, uh, you know, a fire extinguisher at their house or they've bought flood insurance does not mean that they're trying to bring a flood into their life sure. or they're trying to bring fire into their life. Sure. What they're doing is they're saying, hey, I realize there's a potentiality. It's rare, but there's a potentiality this might be happening and I've yeah. taken action. <clears throat> I'm going to have to do this class soon because I've got, you know, a ton of life insurance policies, disability insurance, business insurance. Even though I'm like, do I really need to spend this much money on this thing that I may never use? Yeah. 
but I'm also like, would I regret not having it if something did happen to me? Right. If I did get injured and I have all these expenses on my team, would I be pissed at myself for not having the disability insurance that would cover my salary for the rest of my life or whatever it is for that term that I'm out? And uh, and that's the way I look at it. Would I regret it not having it? Like, yeah. if I if I didn't do the training and I got injured, would I regret and say I should have done the training? Yeah. Unless you feel so confident in your abilities to like take on something, and I'm you know I'm a big guy, and I've you know been in fights before, but I still think that I need the training. Like even though I haven't done it yet, but I'm gonna come and do one soon because it's just good to have a couple little extra tools. Like yeah. I never know if someone's coming at me or what to look at. You know. What's the thing that you always look at when you're walking down the street when you see other people? Are you looking at their hands first to see if they're like clenched or if they got something in their pockets or if they're it's, it's communication and yeah. so and body so, language so in general. body language in general and so so you know we t- I talk about antisocial aggression and antisocial violence so you know the big you know the big tattooed b- biker who's obnoxious at the bar he's not the guy I'm worried about you know he's doing a display he's doing he's, I mean, himself. he's letting everybody know that he's the guy and as long as you give him his social distance he's fine he's yeah. not the guy but you look over in the back and there's the small latino you know gangbanger who's in there and he's just quietly slipping the he's knife out knife. he's got something you know while everybody's paying attention to this guy and this is the guy who really because he's not going to let you know he's truly a predator and he's going to wow. be asocial there's going to be no communication on that. And so that's what I train people. When we train, we train in total silence. And so, you know, I, I, I'm across from one of the, the best MMA gyms in uh, Vegas and stuff. And the guys are great over there. And I like to go over there and, and I, I lift weights over there. I love to watch the training. Yeah. Some world class guys are there all the time. Awesome music. Love the way the guys do the grinds are always training. They go at it, boom. And after a good takedown or something, they help each other up and they're doing It's really cool. Go over to my place. <laughs> No, no communication, no music. no music. People are no talking, really no talking. And if somebody's down on the ground, not because you know we're not violent with each other, you know, I mean, we're not like hurting people, but if you get knocked down on something, I'm not going to help you up. Why is that? I'm not going to do it because it's not going to be there in the street. Yeah, no you're not going to be, you no, you're not, nobody's going to be there. Give me a helping hand. No, you you know, they're going to they're gonna, get they're up gonna be stomping on you or something like that. So what I try to do wow. and, and what people tell me that has made the biggest difference in their life, it's not. The strikes I show them, it's not the fact that I show them where to go, which is all important stuff. Don't get me wrong. The it's physical awareness. training. It's the fact that I recognized when it went asocial. I recognized when there was a lack of communication. And all of a sudden, oh, wait a minute. This guy's not communicating with me anymore. You know, he shut off communication. Therefore, he's about to take action at that point. And that's what saves people's lives. It's kind of having that, that instinct, that awareness, yeah. being aware of your surroundings. Yeah, we've done that. And the other, the other thing, I do training manipulations where I'll have everybody wear ski mask. And the reason I have them wear a ski mask mm. is because we get caught up in the social. And what's amazing with people is I'll show them all these areas of the human body to get a result. But prior to me doing the drill, they'll all be going basically for, you know, some sort of a head shot, some sort of a head communication shot or something like that. And there's, there's many good targets here. Don't get me wrong. But that's what they'll be focused on. They put the masks on and all of a sudden they see the rest of the opportunities because they stop trying to communicate first. Like, a guy will come, an untrained guy will come in and he'll look at your face first and then he'll look at a body because he's trying to communicate with you even though we, we're social animals. We want to communicate. The predators, the ones that we have to worry about are the ones that know how to exploit that. Mm-hmm. And they'll thank you. They'll, they'll get you to communicate while they're taking action. Boom. Yeah. yeah. And that's, that's really what you have to learn how to manipulate. Wow. Have you ever been in a situation where you missed the cues and you had to defend yourself? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I've, yeah. Had, I've had situations where, um, and it, what, what has been lucky for me, I, you know, the, the, the great thing that I tell my students all the time is there's nothing magical about me. I've been 25 years of doing this stuff. I'm a world-class master close combat trainer. I've trained just about every type of elite unit there is out there. Mm-hmm. I've done it all over the world. Done knives, 52 guns, countries, weapons. Done all that stuff in there. I literally walk out this door right now, catch a pipe to the back of the head. I go down just like everybody <laughs> yeah, else. Exactly. I'm not immune to yeah, it, you yeah, know? Yeah. And that's the great thing about it is like, yeah. you know, what scares everybody is also what should encourage everybody. This works on everybody, you know, and understanding how to manipulate it. It's there. Now, the, the, the great thing about people that I train and, and, you know, somebody like myself is they have to get it right. 
you know, and that's the, that's a great thing. People have, you know, for the most part, when they're doing violence, they have lousy accuracy and lousy mm -hmm. follow through. Mm -hmm. And so they don't get, they don't get a true injury to the human body. Mm -hmm. And that's where you can, you know, that's where you have the ability then, you know, to respond and, and take advantage of that. Cause it's the person that's the person that gets the first injury that usually, you know, ends up, you know, being the dominant, you know, person in the, in the, in the equation there mm -hmm. at that point, you know, yeah. whoever's going to win with violence. And, it's strange. It's, it's another difficult part of the subject in, in the book is the one thing that we have to switch when we're looking at acts of violence is, is one of those things where there's, there's, there's nothing to learn from the victim's perspective. And that's a hard thing for us because when we see an act of violence, we empathize with the victim. Normally. Yes, yes. And we want to say, how could the victim have undone the situation? And that puts us behind the eight ball at that point. You know, and that's something that, uh, uh, that that's something that, that's hard in, in training people to look at an act of violence from the successful use of the tool side right. is a real, it, it's one of the more difficult tasks I have for people. But once they do it, it completely changes the way they look at things mm -hmm. in the tool. Well, you talk about the, the brain being the most powerful weapon. Why is that? Because everything starts at, at the brain. Everything you, the brain will go where you the, the brain, your body will go where the brain tells it to go. So if you tell yourself, I have no chance, I, I mean, <laughs> yeah. brain says, cool, you don't, you're yeah. done. Give you up. Know? Or if you say, you know, you look and go, oh, throat, I can get the throat. And then the brain says, cool, I know how to do that. I'll, I'll do that for you. You know, boom. But it's, it's just amazing. It's how we talk to ourselves. You talk about it all the time when you're, mm -hmm. when you're, you have some of the great people in here talking to them how to use your brain. Mm -hmm. They're just using it for, you know, either business building, personal development or something like this. Health, yeah. The biggest, the most, they, I don't want to trump everybody, but I'm telling you the most, the thing that'll affect your life more than any of that, you can get more money. Mm -hmm. You can, you can rebuild your self-esteem. You can do all those things. If violence comes in your life, man, you can't undo it. So yeah. if you can train your brain to understand violence and to how to respond to that and how to really protect yourself. What I want people to do is I want to protect themselves. When they see an act of violence, I don't want them to do things that are going to make them an easier victim, mm. you know, an easier, what is an that? easier thing. What are well, things? like looking at an act of violence and, and looking at it like, oh, look at this poor guy. How could he have undone that? What I want him to do is what the predators do. I was, I, I got to work. Um, there's a whole section in here of, of the work that I did with uh, corrections and, and, um, you know, talking to a lot of the top, you know, prison gang members through these guys and learning how they look at violence. Violence mm. for them is a very different subject. Yeah. Violence for them is like an entrepreneur looking at, 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 uh, they study at it. cash flow. They study it. You know, it, it's precious <clears throat> stuff. And so yeah. they have to get it right because violence allows them like, you know, how we, you know, uh, you know, a good sales and marketing campaign can fill our coffers and can give us, you know, the cash runway that we need yeah. for them. That cash runway comes from the successful use of the tool of violence. It allows them to control drugs, the yard, it allows them to control the streets. Mm -hmm. It's extremely powerful. So they're very judicious in how they look at violence and they're very, uh, utilitarian. So they don't look at it from an opinion standpoint. They look at it from a results standpoint, yeah. what works. Mm -hmm. So when they look, when they were showing these prisoners, like, you know, acts of violence, not one time did they ever see themselves from the victim's perspective. They always saw themselves as the success, the, the person using a successful tool. They identified with that person, not just because they're violent, because that's the easy thing. Oh, well, they're violent guys. And they're saying it. No, they understood when the environment that they're living in, they can't afford to look at anything other than the successful use. They don't want their brain to associate it uh, with anything other than the successful use. And what they would do is they'd say, oh, yeah, that was good work. That guy did good work. The alpha alphas. They go, they go, yeah, that was good, but I would have done this. And wow. they improve upon it. Now, you sit there and you go, wow, that's really harsh. Is it any more harsh than a world-class golfer visualizing, mm -hmm. you know, his, his putt? You know, he's yeah. going to sit there. He's going to visualize. He's, 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 on the, he's on the fairway. Fairway to, fairway to uh, I mean, um, tee to fairway. Mm -hmm. Fairway to green. And one putt. Yeah. Okay, on there. He doesn't go, you know, tee to the uh, jungle, yeah, yeah. <laughs> jungle yeah, to yeah. the beach, yeah, yeah. you know, and I'm going to four putt. Yeah. yeah. You know, nobody visualizes that. What's well, going to get the best result in exactly. that situation. And so the same thing, same thing with violence, you know, when you look at it, you want to look at it from the successful use mm -hmm. of the tool. It's hard because of the subject. And that's yeah. why I do it. And this is why it's controversial. And this is why I got to give it to little Brown. They, they allowed me to write the book that I've been wanting to write for some time, mm -hmm. because I think this day and age, we are so inundated with acts of violence that we just don't 
have answers for. Yeah. And we look at these situations and we don't, we don't have anything in the toolbox. You know, yeah. we've been told there's nothing we can do, which is a lie. A hundred years ago, you and I, one of, one of the things that you and I would have to do, and the reason I say you and I is because it was mostly men back then that do it. We were not complete in our training, in our ability to have a family and go on until we knew how to take care of ourselves. Mm-hmm. And it was, you know, self-defense and self-protection was just an inherent rite of passage almost. And then it was expected of you. You're expected to be your own first responder, not a brutal person or anything like that, but it was expected that you knew how to protect yourself sure. and your family and your assets. Um, that's gone away. We've outsourced that now uh, to a great point. And like I said, because we've been so successful and we have such an amazing country mm-hmm. um, that we don't have to deal with a lot of physical violence like our, our you know grandfathers did and, yeah. and other generations had to do it. It doesn't mean that we're any less violent. That's the one thing everybody has to understand. People, you know, will sit there and quote these statistics. And I see there's actually a really good motivation guy who I, I can't think of his name, but he did a really good video. But the video is, we're living in the safest times ever and blah, 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 blah. And he's giving all these quotes, the murder rates, this, this, and this. And I'm saying, yes, the murder rates that way. But you're looking at the wrong items. Mm. Murder rate being down isn't because we're any less violent. It's because our medical technology has gotten better. So something, an act of violence that would have killed you five years ago. Saves you now. We now can respond faster. We have better medical technology. We save them. Mm-hmm. But is that act of violence any less violent? No, it's just a manipulation of the statistics at that point. And so we are not any less violent. I was in um, Australia, like, I think about eight years ago. And <laughs> one of the guys pulled me aside in Victoria. Victoria is kind of where they have their, their FBI academy. And, you know, they were all saying how it, it, Australia, oh, we're very peaceful in Australia. We're very peaceful. <laughs> so... This guy pulled, he goes, I want to share this with you. And he pulls out this study that they did. And of the five cities in Australia, if you added them all together, it would be a little bit bigger than New York. So it would be kind of one of our bigger cities, uh-huh. you know, on there. <laughs> it would by, be by far be the most violent city in the United States really? by like quantum leaps and stuff. Wow. It's just because it had been spread out all over the country that, you know, they didn't really look at it. He goes, yeah, he goes, we're really looking at this. He goes, now we have strict gun laws. We have all these other things. He said, but you can't, you can't stop. He basically said that he goes, you can't stop the human brain. You know, the mm. human brain is what, if, if you have the intent to do violence, you will right. find a way to do it, yeah. which is what's scaring everybody with all these latest attacks. You know, um, you know, these latest terrorist attacks that are coming on, um, one of the, the, uh, um, you know, terrorism experts, Walid Faris came in and he announced this, and I think it was, I think it was during one of the European attacks. He said, we're seeing, he goes, he goes, it's the one, it's the one weapon that we can't defeat. And they were, what are you talking about? He goes, the human mind. He goes, mm. we're up against the human mind now. Really? Yeah. He came out and said that. And I was just like, oh my God, I've been saying that for years. That's <laughs> right. great to, I, and not great, but don't get me wrong. I yeah. mean, but that's the truth. The truth is we can't, you know, we, we can, we can outlaw everything, you know, in Britain, they tried it. Like they've, they have such strict laws on say, uh, on, on knife laws there. To the point to where if you went to go buy like a butter knife, like a regular butter knife, it has a warning label on it. Really? Do not misuse this. You know, do not stop. I mean, that's, the, and it's a feel good measure because the person that would, you know, they would pick up something, they could pick up a screwdriver, they could pick up whatever. They'll, they'll use that. You know, what the real dangerous thing is the fact that you have somebody that wants to do violence to you. Mm-hmm. And what's really scaring us now is this idea of just using everyday tools, everyday things Anything. like cars and stuff like that, and just attacking, you know, because now we're seeing that, yeah, the human mind, if it's given opportunities, mm-hmm. which by studying, when I went in and I studied all the prison gangs, you see how innovative they are. Yeah. And these are guys literally Anything. with nothing. And they're able to cobble together things and, and create weapons Crazy. and do things in environments that you and I just can't imagine it could ever happen. Yeah, I mean, I remember hearing stories of my brother when he was in prison for four and a half years, just like the, the crazy stuff that would go down, uh, you know, from inmates yeah. in the yard or at night or whatever. It's just like the, I would never want to be in there. Let's just no. say that. <laughs> no, I mean, in the times that I was there, I, I, had, uh, um, I had a grudging respect and I have to say this carefully because it sounds like I'm glorifying these guys. Yeah. But I had a grudging respect when I studied some of their uh, their training methodologies. And I don't mean training methodologies just there, but training methodologies from even an entrepreneurial standpoint. Mm-hmm. The books they read. All the same books that every entrepreneur reads. You know, they'll yeah. be like, you know, 40 years of power. <laughs> the, the prints, you know, they'll, they'll sit there and look at abnormal psychology. Uh-huh. All the things that we do. The differentiation is they have a heavy dose of anatomy in there. 
and wow. and, and what, understanding like the organs. And well, this because and that. the the one Mexican mafia guy that they interviewed there, he was one of their their head guys that had defo- de- deflected and he uh, defected and he he was given. He said, yeah. He goes, you don't understand. He goes, we study anatomy because violence is our currency. He goes, we have to be good at doing violence. We have to be good at killing because that gives us our power mm-hmm. on that. And what's interesting is. It's the only thing, like I looked at that book list that he, that he outlined and I looked at the JFK special operations officer course and what they're required to, to look at it at, uh, at Fort Bragg. Almost every book was the wow. same there, except for anatomy and physiology. They ignore, our first responders are ignoring, you know, the basics of, you know, what to do, you know, with the human body and everything, sure. wow. which I think is really telling and interesting. Crazy, man. Um, what, let's say, what are the three things, if, if someone can't go to one of your workshops or a self-defense workshop that they choose not to, right. um, what would you say the three things they should have in their tool belt, whether from, first, I'm, I'm guessing it's instincts and awareness of the situation and feeling if something's off, like to be aware and to do the awkward or uncomfortable thing. Yeah. I don't know if that's the first thing, but what would be the three things that everyone should have in their tool belts if they want to have something in terms of self-defense? It's not that they should have this in the toolbox. They should have this in their awareness. Number one. Phone. Phone. This is the biggest distraction anywhere. I've got mm. a video uh, in Seattle on a bus. <clears throat> Everybody's lost in their phone like <laughs> yeah. this. There's a guy. There's a guy walking down the middle of the aisle with a 45, robbing people, taking their phones, taking all their stuff. Nobody's communicating with each other. No one's noticing this fear. Close. No one's feeling the fear. We're this close to each other across the, and, and this is happening to you and I don't have no awareness. And literally this one guy is there and the gun comes right to here. And he's not even aware. He's and like, he goes, oh, oh. And, and he's the only guy that takes action. And so what does he do? He's there with this hand. He deflects and gets up and he penetrates. He actually goes towards the guy, which is a really good move, penetrates in and this hand, he has his, weapon. His, his phone. What do you think he does with it? Hits him over. You'd it think, right? Yeah. Yeah. What's no. he do? Stuff and he's trying to stuff it into his pocket. Why? He's so used to like this protecting is my the phone, phone, protecting the phone. His life is on the boom, line. Boom! Smash it in the eye or yeah. the throat or something. I, I, right? I show this all the time. People are like shocked when they see it. Wow. They go, "You don't understand this." Uncle. Now, good <clears throat> news is the rest of the group jumped on him. Everything's wow. good. Got away. So he got to seven people before that happened. Oh. And they were so immersed in our technology. This, these things are great. Don't get me wrong. They're awesome. They're, but what they've done to us, this, the ear, ear, earbuds, mm-hmm. you know, I, I mean, people are just taking away sensory systems. These are all things that you, you've heard them before, but until you see it, until you literally, and, and the one thing about closed circuit TV now is we have all these acts of violence that we see, all these criminal acts where you can just see people being taken advantage of. That'll cut down probably 95% of it. And it's hard because we're so used to earbuds. We're so yes. used to like, and we like that privacy. We like to be able to get on to a subway or something mm-hmm. like that. And I don't have to talk to anybody, you know, yeah. you just that's get the case. Keep your eyes open. Yeah. And so that's probably the only one thing I can tell everybody is mm. it's, it's taking us over at, at that point. Um, then I would say, you know, the general awareness yeah. thing is the other thing is just paying attention to your gut feelings on that. And the third thing is checking your ego. Yes. And what I mean by it, it's so easy and we're so, we, we live in a world where we assume we know what the other guy's thinking. We assume we're on the same page. And I come from a world because of who I see in my clients where I understand, no, we actually live in a world that's full of disproportional responses. And so you and I might think we're in a verbal altercation and we can say something, you know, and I can, I can, you know, I can start using expletives with you and I can, Hey, MF or whatever. And that's okay for me because my friends and I talk like that to each other. It's not okay with you oh. that with you, threat. that is a real threat yeah. that responds with an overwhelming source of violence at that point. I heard, uh, I heard an interview with, uh, uh, actually one of our friends, uh, Ryan holiday. Uh-huh. And, uh, he was talking in one of his books. He was talking about the fact that uh, um, he said, oh, yeah, you know, he was talking about the gang members. And uh, he said, you know, this gang member, you know, he's tagging. He's resp- He's responding because somebody crossed out his tag. And he said, you know, he, if he just lived a higher life, you know, if he could if, if he could do that. And I was I was thinking to myself at the time. And I talked to Ryan about this after. And Ryan said, God, I didn't think about it that way. <clears throat> what he doesn't understand is uh, what, what most people don't understand is we see a mark being X'd out. He sees, oh, my ability to make money and territory has just been challenged. 
if I do not respond to this, I'm going to lose this whole section. My and this is this yeah. is it. This is how I make my money. This is how I love. This is how I survive. And oh, not only that, they're going to come after me if I show weakness mm. at that point. <clears throat> so what to you and I seems as a ridiculous you know, paint war right. that's going on <laughs> to them has real meaning. Wow. You know, and so it's a, it's all context that you that you think about sure. it. Sure. We can avoid so much by not playing into that and not allowing our egos to get with us. And I get it, man. When I was a young guy, you know, I responded to a lot of things I shouldn't have. You know, uh, when I was there, I was overly confident. I was in the special operations community. I was doing intelligence work. I was in South America. You I thought, thought you had I was all in, the answers. Yeah. 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 And so I did some dumb things when I came back and I let my ego get the better of me. I wanted to show off. I wanted to show people how good I was at fighting yeah. and, and stuff like this. How's that feel when you got a stab it, in the arm? Yeah. You know? <laughs> well, it wasn't until I lost one of my friends oh. um, it, it, that I realized it's over like that. It's not worth it. Yeah. It doesn't it, matter how good you no, are. No. And, and, and over what? You know, um, recently I heard, uh, uh, there's a great MNA commentator, uh, former heavyweight champ, Boz Rutten, hilarious guy, great guy, but he told a story and I thought it was really telling. I thought it was really, I, I really had a lot of respect for him telling the story. He was in Amsterdam. Mm. Uh, I believe it was Amsterdam and, uh, he was at a bar and he got, he, these guys were giving him a hard time and, and he, he suckered into it and he went out back and two of them jumped him and he beat the hell out of him. And he, he knocked one guy down, boom, he knew the second guy, he really hit. And the guy hit his head. And Boz ran. And he tells about a terror filled night in a hotel room where he was literally kind of covered in the other guy's blood, just thinking the police were going to come get him. And they didn't. He and he conveyed that. You they know, it, get, they it, got it, him. Yeah, it, it, he was fine. He, he was fine. The guy was there. There's no conviction, nothing or anything like that. Wow. But but Boz knew by the grace of God that that it was and he realized, oh my God, it wasn't not only was it not worth it, it would have taken everything away from him. His whole life would be point. over. Yeah. yeah. Over, over something that was completely ego-based uh -huh. at that point. And I thought for a guy like that to admit something like that was really kind of cool because a lot of those guys don't like to, to, to tell stories like that. You know, yeah. they like to show a little bit of uh, humanity basically uh -huh. on, on something sure. like that. Sure. And, uh, and that was it. And, and it's just not worth it, man. Mm -hmm. I mean, violence, the way I look at it is, you know, people ask me all the time, you know, uh, how, how can you relate? What, what do you, what do you mean by violence? And I said, well, I'll usually ask a group of people, hey, how many, how many people in this class, you know, like it's one of my classes, how many people in this class know how to swim? And, you know, I'll get, you know, just about everybody, you know, raises their hand for the most part. And I'll say, okay, of those of you that know how to swim, has anybody in here ever had to swim for their life? And a few hands will still stay up usually, and mm. along with mine, because I've had to swim for my life a couple of times. Wow. And I said, mm. okay, of any of you that ever had to swim for your life, would you ever want to experience that again? And everybody's hand comes down. And, and that's what real violence is. If you hear somebody bragging about, I got in this fight, I did that. He chose to use violence. That was, a, he wasn't devoid of choice. People that experience real violence don't want to talk about it. Don't want to ever have it happen to them again. And are just very thankful that they survived it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a tool that, you know, that you hope you never have to use. But you're so thankful if you have the information, you know, at that time. Because unfortunately, you know, like, my tagline normally, you know, for everybody is, uh, violence is rarely the answer, but when it is, it's the only answer. And, and that's the truth. And that's why this is a, the, the provocative question is when is violence the answer? Because we've been told it's never the answer and that's a lie. Sure. There's actually a time, but you have to clearly define it. Yeah. And that's what we're trying to do with this. I love it, man. I'm excited for this. Make sure you guys pick up a copy. When violence is the answer, learning how to do what it takes when your life is at stake. Check it out timlarkin.com. Uh, a couple questions left for you. This one's called The Three Truths. I don't know if I asked you this last time, um, but you've written many books. You've done workshops for two decades. You've met with the top fighters, leaders in the world from all different walks of life. Let's say uh, it's your last day and you don't have any work, video, books out there. It's all been erased, okay. but you get to leave a message to the world uh, that is your three truths, the three things that you would share with the world, whether it be three lessons or three ideas. You got to write it on a piece of paper, and that's all people would have to remember you by are these three truths. What would you say are yours? First one's pretty easy. Don't waste any time on the wrong relationship. It is probably the biggest, if I look back on my life, it is the biggest time vampire that I've mm. had trying to make a bad relationship work. 
you know, um, it, it affects every aspect of your life. And, I, and I, if I tell any young kid, I tell my son this all the time, I tell everybody, because you, you can get caught up, especially if you're a guy and you try to be like the white knight type thing. Um, so that would be, that would be one. Uh, number two is you have to follow your path. You, you cannot avoid your path. You know, Steve Pressfield talks about it all the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's, he was a, he's the reason I wrote this book. You know, he was, I, I met him years ago and he encouraged me to do this, but his whole thing about resistance, you know, it's going to get you sooner or later, whatever that is, it, whatever's in you is going to come out and you've got to let it, you've got to let that thing go because the more you avoid it and, and there's, there's brilliant ways we all figure out how to avoid it. You know, we can avoid it through a bad relationship. We can avoid doing our real work through, you know, um, you know, saying, well, I got to take care of the kids. I got to do all this other stuff, but it's going to eat at you. You know, during that, I've seen, I've seen literally three people in my life not follow what they needed to do. And it it took a toll on them on there. So it'd be that. And then the last one is, (sighs) look at the unconventional. Look at things. You're going to probably learn some of the best information. Like with this information, I learned some of the best information from the worst people. You know, the people that you thought had no redeeming qualities whatsoever. I'm not saying that's, that this was from my path, but I would say, look, look where nobody else is looking. Mm-hmm. You're going to find some really interesting stuff. You know, when I, it was jarring when I looked here you know, for this particular thing when I, when I went there and every time I've looked in the unconventional path, I found some really interesting material that I wouldn't find anywhere else. And I see too many people just following, just, just, you know, they, they, they just run down the same path everybody else is running down, you know, and, uh, you find your real gems and you find a lot of it with people who aren't very good at communicating. You know, you're going to find some, there, there's some real difficult personalities out there that you can learn some amazing stuff from, but you have to be able to put the time in. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Is there anything missing from your life? That is a hell of a question. Yes. Yes. <laughs> of course. What is that? Of course there's stuff missing from my life. What's the main thing missing? Uh, there's not enough time to do everything you want to do, you know? And, and I, uh, at this stage of the game, I had hoped to have spent my time building um, more of a uh, instructor base than I have, you know, like to, to pass the information on. Oh, so like instru- so, certifying. Yeah. Instructors. And so what I'm doing, instead of doing, you know, we, 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 we've trained so many people and I do have a good group of instructors and we've done that, but we all look at each other going, you know, and, and so we're trying to now archive everything. So it outlives us and stuff, yeah, yeah. but it is something that I should have been doing 20 years ago and going that path, you know, and put that time in now. So I'd have those people sure. and, you know, I regret that. And, and, and that's missing, you know, professionally from my life. Got it. You know? Got it. Cool. Um, well, before I ask the final question, I want to acknowledge you for a moment for your courage to share and talk about things that most people don't want to talk about. And to give us tools, humanity tools, to protect good people when bad things happen. Because I think that's when we should have this information. Not using it as a weapon just because our, we're hurt or we're upset or something in life. But I really believe you're helping a lot of people create awareness that could save their life. So I want to acknowledge you for all the work you do and for lifting humanity up as opposed hey, to putting humanity down. Appreciate yeah. that. Yeah, Thank yeah, you. Of course. Um, make sure you guys, again, get the book, When Violence is the Answer. It's out right now or you can pre-order it if uh, it's not out it's out in a few days um learning how to do what it takes when your life is at stake by new york times best-selling author tim larkin um where can we connect with you online i know you have a free video series for this too when people yeah. get the book they can get access to a free series is that right yeah if they go to either um you know timlarkin.com or we actually have a for the book when violence is the answer.com if you uh if you pre-order the book then you just come back and just sign up and I'm going to give you a 10 module course sure. that where I get to go in, you know, you and I talked, I'd put a lot into this book uh, that I wasn't yeah. able to share. Yeah. And so I get to do all the additional materials. Over video that lessons. Time. Yeah. Do you show like techniques in there. Yeah, as we're well? going to show everything. I'm going to show video. I'm going to show actual videos of, of acts of violence to illustrate things. I'm going to wow. show interviews from the prisoners, you know, wow. and, and just really good stuff that really highlights what's in the book. So if you can't come to a workshop of yours, all you got to oh, do is idea. get the book. Yeah. You get access to his free training online. For the people that support, 
they, you know, they're, they're good enough to support me with an order, especially on such a controversial subject. I'm yes. going to go out of my way to make sure they get their value. Sure, sure. So. I love it. Make sure you guys pick up a copy. Um, and then you're Tim Larkin everywhere on social media? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tim Larkin, if you see me, I'm on uh, TFT Tim Larkin and Twitter. Uh, and then Tim Larkin on Facebook. Yeah, Instagram. I'm all over. Yeah, Instagram, cool. I'm there. Cool. Uh, final question for you is what's your definition of greatness? I should know. I should know you're going to ask me that. <laughs> I listen to you all the time with this. Um, probably, probably the, the, the real definition of greatness is the ability to have the courage to do whatever it is that you have in you to actually step out there. In fact, after this, I'm going to ask you to give somebody a push that needs a push. Uh -huh. um, but there's so many people that have things that they want to share. And, you know, the, the, the definition of the greatness are those that take that fear and make it happen and use it as a motivator and get going. And I see so many people that just, they have great information to share and they just won't take that next step. Mm -hmm. And for me, that's where the greatness comes from because that's when we get information that we don't get. Yeah. You know, I get to hear some amazing people on your podcast who that's what they did. They, they step forward. And what's really mm -hmm. kind of cool is you, you highlight this a lot. The other good thing is you find out these are normal people. Yeah. These are guys that have the same fears as we all have. I mean, that's really what I get out of listening to your, to your show all the time is the story behind the guy yeah. and the fact, or, or girl and this fact that, hey, they're normal people. They have normal challenges, normal fears, and none of that stopped them from taking that next step. Sure. And sure. to me, that's that's just, if you only get one shot at life, that's, that's the greatness you can give. That's it. Tim, thanks so much. You got it, brother. Appreciate it. Good seeing you.